Good evening. I'm really excited about tonight, and we're excited that you took your Friday night to be with us. I'm Liliana Lengua. I'm the director of the Center for Child and Family Wellbeing. We're a research center uh, that focuses on promoting social and emotional well-being in children, mostly by focusing on the adults in their lives, promoting the well-being and skillful social emotional capacities of parents and caregivers, providers and teachers in children's lives the people who really make a difference in children's lives. Um, in addition to the research that we do, uh, part of our mission is to share research knowledge and evidence-based practices with you, the community, people who are making a difference in children's lives. And um, we do that with um, events like this public lecture, workshops, trainings, uh, mindfulness and compassion-based classes, um, and programs that are designed to be implemented in diverse communities. Um, and so we are able to do that work thanks to the very generous support of the Mertz Family Foundation. And they're the folks that have made tonight's evening possible. So thank you for joining us. And it's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Sam Himmelstein. He's a licensed psychologist working in chemical dependency program at Kaiser Permanente with teens and their families. He's in private practice in Oakland, California, and he researches the efficacy of mindfulness-based interventions with incarcerated and underserved adolescent populations. And I took this list off of what he has on his website, but tonight he listed like six other things he's doing to training and consultation and other work. He's an author of a multiple scholarly articles and two books, a mindfulness-based approach to working with high-risk adolescents and a mindfulness-based substance abuse treatment for adolescents. And he's writing a new book, so look out for that in about nine months or so. Um, I'm saying that so he's motivated to finish it and get it out the door. <laughs> he travels the country speaking at conferences and conducting professional trainings. Uh, he just told me that he just got back from a six-city um, travel tour, um, doing trainings in six different places. We're the last stop. And um, he's the founder and president of the Center for Adolescent Studies. Dr. Hamelstein's passionate about training professionals from multiple disciplines in creating authentic healing relationships with adolescents that contribute to positive outcomes. A formerly incarcerated youth himself, Dr. Hamelstein is privileged to catch his, to change his life from path of drugs, violence, and crime and self-destruction to that of healing and transformation. His mission is to help young people become aware of the power of self-awareness and transformation and train professionals to support that transformation in youth. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Hanks. Thank you. <laughs> I will probably not get that book done in nine months. Um, <laughs> It comes out nine months after you're done with it once you submit it to the publisher. So I still have to submit it to the publisher. And I've, I've prolonged it almost a year at this point. But I thought to myself, it's my book. So it's not like they're going to get someone else to write it, right? You know? <laughs> um, so anyways, let me, let me just tell you, we're going to be here for, you know, till about 8.30. So I'm going to kind of go over some very introductory but potentially transformative and powerful concepts, and we'll leave some time for some Q&A too. Um, but I always like to kind of start with saying a little bit more about myself just to contextualize it. Part of my pedagogy is I just think it's important for you to know the people that come in and, and, and share their knowledge or wisdom or whatever with you, and I'm going to ask some questions about the group too so I can get to know you a little bit. Um, so. As was just stated, I'm a, I'm a licensed psychologist and I mainly specialize in working with uh, very, very high risk populations, primarily kids in the juvenile justice system, but also kids in the foster care system as well. And I live in Oakland, California, which probably a lot of you all know about. You guys like the Seahawks out here, right? <laughs> Marshawn Lynch is from Oakland, so that's, that's the connection. You know, I see you with the Seahawks shirt on. Um, what's, what's going on with these? Uh, this football team, are you guys going to win this Rose Bowl or what? Yeah, yeah? I don't know. That didn't sound too enthusiastic. <laughs> I feel like if I was giving this talk at Ohio State, it would have been like a definite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, but I, uh, I, so I spend most of my time or a lot of my career has been working with young people who have been heavily impacted by trauma, both trauma that's happened to them personally, but also trauma in the communities as well. 
And um, as was also stated, my path really started, like the reason why I'm here is because I had my own troubles as a, as a teenager. And I found myself in the juvenile hall about seven different times. And in between all those times, I was on house arrest, I went to group homes, you know, a lot of different, I was basically on the path of a lot of destruction. And, um, you know, very long story short, I was able to turn my life around with a lot of inner work, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of support from my parents. I grew up in a two-parent household. A lot of my black and brown friends uh, didn't have the same privileges of me and, and didn't get awarded the same opportunities that I got. So I stand on the shoulders of a lot of, of those types of experiences being here. But, but that's what really drives me to do this work. And, um, so I grew up in Berkeley, which is right next to Oakland, and all of that is in Alameda County. And I, I, I left my full-time job working on the maximum security unit of the Alameda County Juvenile Hall. So I was basically a unit clinician, day in and day out, working with young folks. Um, and like I said, I had my own kind of struggles in the justice system, and I grew up in the same county I worked in. So I literally was working in the same juvenile hall that I used to be locked up in about 20 years prior. And I don't know, anybody here work in the juvenile detention center up here or probation department or anything like that? Oh, what's up? You guys know that, uh, you know, sometimes probation departments have really good pensions. I don't know about up here, but down there they do. They have really good unions and pensions. So I go back in there 20 years later and there's some of the same folks who used to work there when I was locked up. Now that I'm working side, now I'm there working side by side with them because they're still there 20 years later. And a lot of that has, those experiences inspired me to be able to, to do the work that I do. And so I just say that to say, I really appreciate you all, you all coming here and your attention. And um, you know, I know this is a lecture, so it's like I'm talking to you all, but I just wanna kind of own the, uh, or name the fact that you all have a lot of wisdom too. And, and if this was more of like a, a real class, or I guess this is a real classroom here, right? <laughs> um, you know, my style of real class would be more of a, an ebb and flow, more of a dialogue because there's a lot of wisdom in the, in the group here. So, so anyways, um, how many folks here work with youth directly? Awesome. Any therapists in the room? Okay, awesome. Thank you for being here. What else do I have up here? How about teachers, educators? Great, welcome, awesome. How about folks who work with youth heavily impacted by trauma? Okay, cool. How many folks here have ever taught a young person uh, a mindfulness technique, even if it's just a short breathing technique? Great, you guys are in the right space. And how many people here, by show of hands, will say you have your own personal mindfulness practice? Good, one of the first crowds ever for the same amount of hands to go up for this question as the last question. Usually it's people saying, I teach you mindfulness all the time. Then when I ask, do you have your own practice? All those hands go down, you know? So one of the things that I don't get to emphasize enough is that in order to do this work effectively, it's important to have our own practice in some type of way, whether, it, whether you meditate every day, whether you just think about how you show up in the room with other people, people of different races, genders, sexualities, thought processes, whatever they are, right? If you have your own practice, your own way to reflect on yourself, if you think about your own self-awareness, it's gonna help you teach it to other people. And I'm not gonna emphasize that too much in the rest of the talk because we only have a little bit of time, but that's one of the things I really, really heavily believe to make this work effective because when you're doing what I'm talking about, whether you're a therapist, a probation officer, a mentor, or a teacher, where are the main tools that we use? Like you go to a car mechanic and they have their tools to fix your car. For us and our work, where are the main device that we use? So it's important to tune that up by having our own practice. Um, just really quick, I'm just gonna talk about in this next hour or so, maybe a little bit less so I can leave some room for time. We're gonna talk about what mindfulness is and for those of you who work with youth, I'm gonna define mindfulness in a very youth receptive kind of innovative way and I'm gonna say take it, do what you want with it, use it tomorrow, put your own tweaks on it. We're gonna talk about why, by why, some, why we're gonna talk about, about why something like mindfulness can be useful, like what's the conceptual map, what's the logic model. Um, and we're gonna talk about really how do you build relationship through mindfulness and other practices because the relationship, this is shown through a lot of research, but probably you already noticed through your own anecdotal experience that the relationship you have with the youth really has a big impact on if they 
or down with or receive whatever it is you have to offer, whether it's therapy or mindfulness or teaching them math in high school or something like that, right? Um, and then, like I said, we'll do Q&A. Um, by show of hands, how many people here have heard of the Adve uh, Adverse Child Experiences Study? That's right. That's awesome. I like to see that. That's what you get when you come do a lecture at uh, University of Washington. Um, so you know, for those of you who don't know, here's like the 30-second the, the, the version. Mid-90s, researchers were studying chronic obesity. They were really interested in why every time they would help their patients lose weight, they would gain it back. Had an interest, had an inclination that it might have something to do with trauma. Sent us a very brief, very basic survey that asked 10 questions or asked people if they had any of these 10 experiences before the age of 18. And they were all what's called adverse childhood experiences. Have you ever been physically abused, sexually abused, emotionally abused? Um, have you ever witnessed domestic violence? Was one of your family members incarcerated? Was somebody hooked on drugs? Somebody attempts suicide in your family, right? And what they found is people who had had a four, they, they found that, I think it was 25% or so or something like that of the folks, the, the number one reported ACE was people who had a member in their family who was on drugs or alcohol. And they found that people who had four or more of those 10 ACEs, that was like the, the bar for things to get really bad in their life. Like it was correlated with um, a slew of psychological issues, like four to 12 times more likely to be uh, diagnosed with major depressive disorder, suicide attempts, uh, not just psychology, uh, psychological issues, but also medical issues like diabetes, uh, heart failure, things like that, right? So the study was really groundbreaking. It was really seminal. And it was also, the sample was very homogenous. It was mainly middle to upper, upper aged, um, white, mostly women um, who were also insured because it was done through Kaiser, through the health system, right? So a lot of people were like, this is great research, but what if we did this with other populations, but particularly those who don't have the capability of getting you know, pretty good health insurance, right? Because that says something about socioeconomic status. And so there was a study done that was published in uh, 2014 with incarcerated youth. And the just the, the major result that came out of that was youth uh, uh, who were incarcerated uh, in, I think, I believe it was in Florida, um, were four times more likely to have four or more ACEs. And if you remember, the, the, the bar was four ACEs. Once you had four ACEs, so many things came up and so many things, um, you were at risk for so many other things that basically led to more of an early death, right? So this is what like, I'm dealing with on a daily basis when I work with youth. And even with that, the study was also limited in itself. It just talked about these 10 experiences. It didn't take into account community violence. It didn't take into account a slew of other experiences of folks who are grown up in poverty, grown up in other, these other things, right? Um, but it was still good. It still just kind of pointed towards uh, what the community is dealing with and how thick the trauma can be sometimes, right? Um, this is actually a picture right here of the Alameda County Juvenile Hall. Uh, whoever took this picture might get in some trouble because you're not supposed to take pictures in there. But luckily, they didn't get this guy's face. If they got that guy's face, that would probably be problems for them. But in 2006 or 2007, I believe, this is not what it looked like when I was incarcerated there. They got a bunch of, uh, of funding to basically re rebuild the juvenile hall. And now it looks a lot more like a prison. You can see they kind of had the two top tiers. And this is kind of the little recreation area. This was my office over here. If you see this office right here, that's the guidance clinic office where I used to do all my therapy at. Um, so it, I'm, I'm just saying all this to say that when you're thinking about mindfulness and teaching mindfulness to somebody else, and you're thinking about building in a relationship, one of the ways to think about this from a quote unquote trauma informed perspective is to take into account all of these experiences so that we're not um, forcing upon or, 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 or teaching them something that, can, that, that sometimes is going to be very difficult for them if they're triggered by their trauma. Because sometimes when somebody's really triggered by trauma, this part of the brain doesn't necessarily work. It may go offline. If you can just imagine for a moment, somebody say, let's close our eyes and practice some breathing techniques or something like that, right? Like our social engagement system, our, our, our neuroception, our thing that tells us is this environment safe, which is basically telling us, no, it's not safe. Why would I ever want to close my eyes in front of this person, right? Why would I ever want to go into some type of a, a vulnerable practice with somebody like that, right? 
Um, so that's why it's so important when you're thinking about working with populations that are, have experienced so much trauma to think about disseminating this work through a trauma-informed lens, right? Meet them where they're at, build a relationship, and then through that relationship, you really get to discern and attune to them to, um, excuse me, to um, figure out if this is the right thing to do or not, if that makes sense, right? Anybody know who this is? One extra CE unit, who, whoever gets this. <laughs> This is a guy named Stephen Porges. I'm just going to go over this really briefly. Um, every, anybody ever heard of the vagus nerve? Oh, OK. You guys get extra CE credits. Um, <laughs> if you think of our brain, think of this as the brain. Underneath our brain, we have these cranial nerves. And our cranial nerves actually are, play a really important factor uh, uh, or a really important role in what makes us different as mammals and reptiles. I learned this not too long ago. You know what's really interesting? Reptiles can't control the muscles in their face. If you think about like a snake or a lizard or something like that, their face is always like boom. You know, like they can't control the muscles in their face, right? <laughs> um, why is that important when it comes to trauma? Well, we have a very important one of our cranial, we, our cranial nerves are connected to like our facial expressions, for example. One of our cranial nerves is called the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve has much to do with how we assess threat in our environment. So if you think about a little infant, let's just say, for example, anybody here have a little infant or have had a little infant in their life? Anybody had a baby? Awesome. Baby starts crying. Caregiver picks up the baby, right? Starts rocking the baby back and forth. Maybe starts um, uh, sharing some soothing tones or, or noises with the baby to help calm the baby down, right? It's the vagus nerve that connects to the middle ear that helps that baby distinguish that tone from all other tones. And it's other cr cranial nerves that helps distinguish the facial expression of the mother or the caregiver or whoever it is from other um, um, visual stimuli in their environment, right? And the, babe, and, the, and the caregiver who's doing that with the infant, that is where a human being first learns how to self-regulate. So self-regulation starts through relationship. It doesn't start when you're eight years old and somebody teaches you a breathing technique or an anger management technique. It first starts within the relationship of the caregiver. Um, I, I assume maybe most people here have heard of the term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Has anybody ever heard the term RAD, reactive attack, attachment disorder? It's a very interesting um, disorder that has to get diagnosed before somebody is aged five years old. So it's, you diagnose at age five or below. And it's, the, uh, its main um, symptoms are that, you know, if you think of like a, um, a, uh, a little kid, let's say they're three years old, they start crying, right? What do most kids do when they start crying? They try to find their caregiver and they seek out support. People with RAD don't do that. They don't seek out the external resources in the adults around them. Also, one of the other characteristics is, you know, when a baby starts crying, the adult goes to the kid, tries to calm the kid down. Some kids are tough. I have a four-year-old right now. He could be tough sometimes, right? But ultimately, usually they calm down. Kids with RAD also don't respond to the external support from um, uh, the the, exter the, uh, the caregiver. And so what his research, a lot of his research was about was that it's that vagus nerve that starts from a really young age to do what's called neuroception. If you think of the word perception, perception is like what you perceive, it's your senses, right? Neuroception is like your central nervous system doing that to determine if you're in a threatening environment or not. Is this a safe environment? Is this a dangerous environment? Is this a life-threatening environment? All of this is happening unconsciously. We're not thinking about it. It's your central nervous system doing it, right? A lot of his research, well, another study that he was involved in showed that um, kids in an orphanage in Romania who um, they basically, this was like a public funded orphanage. It had so many people coming in and out of there, right? Like caregivers, it was some very high number. I can't remember what it was, but kids were getting passed around all day. They found in a research study that the kids who had the one or two main caregivers didn't develop reactive attachment disorder at the same rate as the kids who got passed around to all of these different adults on a daily basis because they didn't have that constant 
co-regulation, that constant self-regulation with the adult, right? And so what happens with that situation and what happens with somebody who gets extremely traumatized is their neuroception, their ability to unconsciously assess if they're in a threatening or non-threatening environment starts to go haywire. One, you, you guys probably know this, um, has anybody here, by show of hands, all of you who said you work with youth, um, has anybody here ever like, asked the kid to do something and you think in your mind, like you're asking this in a pretty nice, calm tone and they have just like an extraordinary negative reaction to you? Yeah, yeah, I see a lot of head nods, right? So one of the things that happens with youth who are with people who are highly impacted by trauma is that they misinterpret non-threatening stimuli as threatening or dangerous, right? It's because, and that's, that's like the kind of uh, rubber meets the road example of their neuroception going haywire. You're like, hey, could you please sit down? We're trying to get our lesson plan going. And you're like, wow, I just said that in a really nice tone. I'm proud of myself, you know, because maybe you're frustrated or something. But they heard, sit the, sit the F down and shut the F up. You know, they heard, the, they heard it and they interpret it differently. That oftentimes is a symptom of trauma. Not always, but oftentimes, right? And so why is this important? When you're talking about building relationships, what is the first thing that happens when you walk into a room and you start to cultivate a relationship with somebody, their neuroception, their unconscious ability, they're unconsciously analyzing if you are a safe or an unsafe person. Because a lot of the youth who are impacted by trauma, a lot of that comes through interpersonal abuses, physical assault, sexual assault, manipulations, things like that. So trust becomes a very, very important thing when you're working with young people. And again, the logic model here is you develop trust, you develop a relationship, excuse me, and um, then they'll be much more receptive to whatever it is you have to offer. Um, whether it's motivational interviewing or CBT or mindfulness or some other intervention, right? The work starts with the relationship. The work starts when you first meet each other. It doesn't start when you teach them something, right? And so that's, what, that's mainly what we're talking about here. This is, uh, this is what I was talking about with neuroception, and this is the vagus nerve right here. Um, as I was talking about, it's one of, the, one of the 10 or 12 cranial nerves. It's represented by this, uh, this yellow part of the drawing. Anybody ever have, I, I, I know the answer to this, but I'm just going to say it anyways. Anybody ever ha heard that saying, I just had a gut feeling about that person, right? That, that's a kind of common, common phrase in, in, in our language, right? And remember, the vagus nerve, one of those 10 cranial nerves, has a lot to do with the neuroception of assessing whether a situation is safe, dangerous, or life-threatening. Well, if you notice here, You'll also notice that the, this is the longest cranial nerve in our body, and it has to do with our neuroception and our assessment, and it goes all the way into our gut. That's what's, so when, you, so when you hear or think about or say that phrase, I had a gut feeling about that situation or that person, there's actually science to back that up. And that's why when, that's why when somebody says like, oh, I can't explain why I like that person, they just had a good vibe. Or I don't, I don't, I can't, there was nothing I can say about why that person uh, why I don't like that person, I just got a bad vibe from them. It's because there's actually processes happening inside of you that are assessing the situation around you. And again, the take home from this is it's all unconscious. Like it's not like we're thinking about it, right? That's kind of the beauty of our, our, uh, uh, our central nervous system. It's doing this without the brain online. Um, what happens when you get, when you assess, when your neuroception assesses that you're in danger or in a life-threatening situation is you go into, um, maybe you guys have all heard of the fight and flight response, right? Have you heard of that? Fight, flight, and freeze. freeze. Exactly, right? Fight and flight, we're in a, a hyper-vigilant state. Our heart starts pounding. We get ready to mobilize in some way, either fight or run away. Freeze is, we hypo-arouse, we, we, we basically freeze up and we cannot, we immobilize. We cannot do anything, right? So, um, the, I, I present all of this to, to say like, you know, if we're not taking this stuff into account and we're not attuning to the possibility of these processes happening when we first start to engage with young people, um, we, have the, 
we, we may miss a huge portion of what's going on because again, think about these youth, they're coming in with much more adverse childhood experiences, they're coming in with a, a plethora of traumatic experiences, and then they're meeting you, a teacher, a therapist, a social worker, a youth worker, a mentor, whatever it is. And our first job is to build rapport with them. Our first job really is to make us ourselves safe with them so that they can feel it on a vibrational level. And that's what we're talking about today, right? But before we get there, I want to just talk about mindfulness a little bit because I think it's important to, to kind of conceptualize and define what mindfulness is and how I define it with the youth I work with as well. Um, so. This is a definition or a, a metaphor I really like to use with youth. Like when I start a mindfulness group, I'll use this. And so I encourage you to do it too if you, if you like it. Uh, let's say that this was a bone right here. And I was standing in front of a dog right here. And I wave this bone in front of the dog's face. And I throw the bone over there. What do you think the dog's going to do? Go get the bone. Most of the time, dog's going to go get the bone, right? Let's say, don't know why I would ever be in this situation. Let's say I'm standing right here in front of a lion, and I wave this bone in front of the lion's face, and I throw the bone 10 yards over there. What do you think the lion's going to do? <laughs> That's what all the youth say. He's going to eat you. <laughs> he might eat me. He could eat me. There's a fundamental difference between the mind of the dog and the mind of the lion. With the dog, when I'm waving the bone in the dog's face, what do you think the eyes of the dog are doing? Tracking the bone, right? Right? What the, I, I, I move the bone over here, the dog's eyes go over there, I throw the bone over there, the dog goes and gets the bone, right? The dog is just focused on the, the bone, the dog has tunnel vision towards the bone. That's all the dog can see, so if it, it represents the whole, at least for those moments, it represents the whole of the dog's reality. So if I control the bone, I control the dog's reality. If I'm waving the lion, when I'm waving the bone in the lion's face, what do you think the eyes of the lion are doing? Looking at me, looking through the bone, right? It's not that the lion can't see the bone. The lion can see the bone, but the bone is just a small piece of a larger reality, right? So if I throw the bone over there, the lion can say, hmm, maybe I'll go get that bone. Or maybe I'll eat this dude right here, you know? He's got a lot of bones in his body with me on top of him, right? <laughs> you know? The, the lion has options because the lion sees the larger reality, and that's really what mindfulness is about. It's about being present and seeing reality in front of you, but not being reactive to it, right? The metaphor really is like if you think of the bone like um, anger, let's say, for example. When anger arises inside of me, if I react with the mind of the dog, I do whatever it is I do when I get angry. I have tunnel vision with the anger. If I fight when I get angry, I fight. If I yell when I get angry, I yell. I just do what I do when I'm angry. It's like an automatic behavior. If I respond with the mind of the lion, though, it's different, right? It's not that I'm not seeing the anger. It's not that I'm avoiding the anger. I'm very present to the anger, but I know that's not the full of my reality. I'm, I know that's not the full, the whole representation of my life. Anger may arise in me and I may say to myself something like, I'm angry right now. <laughs> Even just having that meta thought, I'm angry right now, can distance yourself from the anger, even if it's just a little bit. Or you might say, I might say something to myself like, um, you know, I've been angry before, I'm going to be angry again. Like, this isn't going to last forever. Again, helping me disidentify from the anger. I'm, again, I'm not trying to push it away. I'm not trying to push away an experience that I'm having. I'm present to it, but I'm disidentifying it so that it doesn't control me, right? That's, that's what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is paying attention in the present moment with an attitude of non-reactivity. And that's why it's a big practice, right? It's something that you have to practice to get good at because the natural condition of the mind is to be all over the place. Our minds get conditioned through different experiences. Um, I'm going to skip past this because I basically just said that. You know, I was thinking, if it's okay with everyone here, can we just practice this for like three minutes? I'd like to take you through like a two or three minute practice, not too long. So put all your pencils down, put your paper down. I'm just going to take you through a two minute exercise and then we'll talk about it briefly afterwards. So, and I'm just going to stand here awkwardly while we do this. Um, what I want to invite you to do, if you want to close your eyes, you can. But you absolutely do not have to close your eyes if you don't want to. 
Usually it's good to have your feet flat on the floor, to sit somewhat straight up. That helps with your respiration and your breathing. Usually folks like to close their eyes because the outside world won't distract them. But again, if you want to keep your eyes open, what I would do is I would just keep a soft gaze a couple of feet in front of you. And what I'll do is I'll ring this bell. And when I ring the bell, just bring your awareness to your breathing and then wait for further instructions. Breathing in, breathing out. I just want to invite you to notice where it's easiest to sense your breath. Could be the nostrils, feeling the actual touch of the air. Could be the belly or the chest. Wherever it's easiest. Let your awareness rest right there. Breathing in, breathing out. You might notice after a few breaths in and a few breaths out, your mind begins to wander. You start to think of things other than the breath. When is this meditation going to be over? What's for dinner tonight? Things come and they go. When that happens, there's no need to think you're doing anything wrong. No need to get annoyed with yourself. It's the nature of the mind to wander. Whenever you notice that, just gently bring your awareness back to your breathing. Breathing in. Breathing out. Your mind may be calm and serene right now, or it may be overwhelmed with thought, or anything in between. Whatever it is, that's okay. This exercise is not about being relaxed or clear minded, it's about using the breath to be present to whatever your experience is. Simply breathing in and breathing out. In a moment, I'll ring the bell. And when I do, I just want to invite you to listen to the sound of the bell until you can't hear it any longer or until it's no longer there. And then when you feel comfortable, if your eyes were closed, you can slowly open them, expanding your awareness to the rest of the room, coming out of the formal meditation. All right, thanks for doing that. Um, can I just, because of time, just maybe like one or two volunteers, anybody want to volunteer to say, what was your experience like? What was that like to go through that exercise? Any experience is okay? Yes, please. Um, hi, my name's Alice. Um, Hello. Um, yeah, no, I was stressed right before this because I was like working on a paper this due tonight. And I was right. like, God, what am I going to sit down and actually take a breath? Because I just came from the high school that I work at. Mm -hmm. I was like, my mind has been on operating on all cylinders all day. So yeah. That would be nice to sit down and just like shut off. Right. And I feel so much better. For sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Also, <laughs> it's top secret. No, I'm just kidding. It's uh, just look up meditation bell on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it may be worth the uh, $8 investment. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. How about one more? How about somebody else? What was that like for you? Yes, please. I appreciate I, in my mindfulness practice I've done before. I appreciated that you said, like, it's in the nature of the mind to wander. Mm -hmm. Because I think oftentimes it's like 
if your mind wanders, like pull yourself back. Right. Then, I don't know. I appreciate that. It felt easier to return to Sure. That. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And that's a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about. You know, a lot of times when people do a practice like that, it's not uncommon to feel, well, we did that for like three minutes. It's not uncommon to feel relaxed afterwards. If you didn't feel relaxed, that's okay too, because that's not uncommon either. But a lot of people, when they sit down and they put the effort in, they'll feel relaxed afterwards, right? If you meditate for longer periods of time than two or three minutes, which is really what the practice is designed for, you'll notice, and sometimes even with less, right, you'll notice that your mind begins to wander a lot more. You start to have a normal range, full range of human experiences, right? Maybe at some times you feel relaxed. Sometimes your mind's like, how am I going to finish this paper later? Another time you're like, my knees hurt, you know, what's for dinner? You know, like all this stuff starts to come up the more you sit down and pay attention to your experience. And that's really what it's designed for because we're not necessarily trying to elicit relaxation. There are strategies known as relaxation techniques that are designed to elicit relaxation. And if you practice them and put a lot of effort into them, you can get good at them. But mindfulness is just about being present to whatever is. And this is probably the biggest misconception that I hear about. I do this all around the country, all around the world. Most people, when I say, what is mindfulness, and I ask the group, they'll say, closing your eyes, relaxing, take, taking a couple of calm breaths. If you feel relaxed afterwards, that's great. There's no problem with that. There's no, no reason to take away the fruit along the path, right? But the path is really leading to just being present with whatever is. Because if you try to, for example, teach youth mindfulness and they think you're talking about relaxation, especially with highly traumatized youth in general and people in general, but especially with highly trauma impacted populations, what's going to happen when they get really dysregulated, when they're starting to go into that fight, flight, or freeze mode and they try to do your relaxation? technique or your mindfulness that technique that they think the goal of is to relax. What do you think is going to happen? I didn't hear anything anybody said because everybody said something at once. I'll tell you the answer. It's not going to work. <laughs> and what happens when it doesn't work? Then that kid says, that shit doesn't work. I'm not doing that. And then what happens? They build a, a excuse me for using a bad word. Sorry about that. Um, um, what happens is they build off that negative momentum and they're like, that thing doesn't work, it's not for me, and they don't get the fruit of the practice because they weren't taught it in the right authentic way from the beginning. And so I really drill this point in, when you, if you're teaching, for yourself first, obviously, but if you're teaching mindfulness, particularly to young people, it's really important to have this conversation and say, relaxation can result sometime, and that's great, I never want to take that away, but for those times when you try this and you can't relax, just remember, it's really about being present because when you practice presence and you bring your awareness to the present and you practice that non-reactivity, that's the mindful, that's the, that's the lion mind, right? That's when the bone of anger, the bone of a triggered trauma, the bone of somebody calling you a bad name, a, 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 a teacher at school uh, making you angry, whatever it is, all of those are bones. And if you remember the lion, the lion is sitting there present to whatever it is around him or her, right? And so it's just really important to, to drill this part home because you, I never want to set a kid up for failure because if you define mindfulness as calming down, failure will definitely result. I've been meditating for 20 years and there's times when sometimes I still get angry or still get dysregulated and if I try to calm down, it's really, really, really difficult to calm down. And that's after like 20 years of training some really intensive periods too, you know? Because sometimes getting triggered and getting angry is part of being a human being. And mindfulness is about being present to that human beingness, not necessarily trying to say, I am like a meditation robot and I feel no emotions. That's not what it's about, you know? I don't want to hang out with that person, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, real quick, uh, anybody ever heard of a man named Viktor Frankl? Cool, Check, Google him if you haven't heard of him. He wrote a book called uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He was a Holocaust survivor and um, he has written a number of books. This is probably his most famous quote from his most famous book, which is Man's Search for Meaning. And it says, between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In that response lies our growth and our freedom. Basically what we're talking about with the lion mind, right? Stimulus, the bone, response. 
how do I respond or react to that bone? The practice is building that space and being present to that space so that I have some choice and some autonomy how I respond to that bone, right? This is a guy who he never went to a different part of the world to study spirituality. This is all his own insights through um, his own experiences of suffering in the Holocaust camp, right? And so to me, mindfulness really is perennial wisdom. It comes up in a lot of different cultures, a lot of different spiritual traditions, and it's called a lot of different things. But this practice of being present and the, the, um, the quality of non-reactivity or non-judgment, as it's sometimes said, comes up over and over again in the world through people's experiences like this. And oftentimes, it's people having insights when they're uh, experience immense oppression and suffering like this person was, right? Um, quick quote, I'll go over this really quick just because I want to get to this juicy stuff about the relationship, but I was working with a young man. He, um, he was in a juvenile detention camp, so in California, we have all these county level juvenile detention camps and some of them, so you're, ba you're basically locked up and you're a ward of the court, but instead of like being in a room in a juvenile hall like that other picture I showed you, you're in a camp or you're in a, uh, a dormitory like setting, but you're still technically like a ward of the court. And in some of the camps, and particularly in the camp that he was in, uh, if you're good, you get to go home on the weekends, basically it's called a home pass, right? So this kid was in my research study. I worked with him for a very long time. And I asked him basically, you know, after everything was done, I was interviewing him for this study. And I said, you know, how has this impacted you, this mindfulness practice, if at all, any of the techniques? This is what he said. He says, I'm not going to lie. I was supposed to not come back to camp. Again, uh, one of the things I forgot to say was when kids run away from the camp, because there's not a fence around it, they just, instead of just, but it's in the middle of nowhere, instead of just like running from the camp, because that would be super rough, they wait until they go on a home pass and they don't come back. That's how somebody AWOLs technically, right? So he says, I'm not going to lie, I was supposed to not come back to camp. I was supposed to hit the blunt, the marijuana, when I was back in the house, because my boy, when we got back to the house, he was out there rolling the blunt. I'm not going to lie, once I saw him in the wheelchair, I already knew I was going to do something, drink or something. I used stick. This is a mindfulness-based technique we taught him. Um, I kind of looked at him, I took a deep breath, and I was just, and I calmed down, sat down, and I was like, damn, it's good to see you. But at the same time, I was really thinking about the blunt. He was like, you gonna smoke? I was like, nah, I'm good. He was like, fool, what the F, since when do you say no? So this kid, just to contextualize this quote, his friend that he saw in the wheelchair was not in the wheelchair before he went into the juvenile detention camp. He was in a, from a community of violence. He was shot in the back. This kid goes on the home pass, sees his friend for the first time in the wheelchair. Friend offers him marijuana and, and or alcohol to use. I don't know about you, but knowing my 15-year-old self, I definitely would have smoked the weed. I would have been triggered. My own trauma would have been triggered. My loyalty would have been triggered. I would have been like, screw this. That's what he's saying. He's like, I'm so, I was supposed to not come back because he, he started to recognize that thinking of like, F it, screw it. I'm just going to get high, et cetera, et cetera. Then he uses a technique that we taught him, a mindfulness-based acronym, which helped him actually get into the moment, take a breath, and think about what he wanted to do, which was, no, I don't want to screw up this whole situation at camp. If I run away, I'm going to get caught at some point again and have to basically restart this whole process in the juvenile justice system. So this is like, you know, I can, I can, I can tell you, like, here is the research on this, this program that I did, and here are the statistics and the significant differences from pre to post test, but that's all statistics. This is like where the rubber hits the road right here in terms of somebody's personal experience. This is real life relapse prevention and reduced recidivism. But the thing I like about this quote the most, more, even more so than that, is right here he says, um, where is it? He says, but at the same time, I was really thinking about the blunt. Remember what the practice is. The practice is to be present. And a lot of people in the addiction field sometimes are like, do whatever you need to do to like not think about it and, and trick yourself into not wanting to do it. Because at the end of the day, if you, if you don't relapse, that's number one, right? So sometimes people get told to, not, to try and avoid. But remember, the practice of mindfulness is to be present. And he was very, very extremely present in the moment, what was going on inside of him. And even with that, he was able to make that decision to not go down that path, to come back to camp, to basically tell me the story, right? Um, so, so anyways, this is, like I said, this is, I love, I share this quote all the time. Um, 
I uh, was um, walking around in a Safeway. Do you guys have Safeways up here? Yeah, I was walking around in a Safeway. And uh, well, you go to the East Coast and it's like, they don't know what that is. If you t talk to them about a Kroger or something like that, they'll know what that is. Um, <laughs> and I see this guy kind of walking, this huge dude walking behind me. And so my fight or flight, the prickly hairs on my neck start to go up. And I'm like, who is this dude kind of scoping me out, you know? <laughs> And I turn around and I see this humongous dude, and it's him. And he's like, Sam, what's up? This is in Safeway. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, what's up, man? We embrace, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I met this kid when he was 15, and um, I see him in the, with his shopping cart. He's got a 12 pack, and I'm like, man, what the hell are you doing, dude? What are you buying beer? You're not old enough to, you're not 21. I was like, wait, are you 21? He was like, yeah, I'm 21. <laughs> And uh, yes, he was buying beer, but uh, hadn't been back to jail, you know, was still alive. Some big wins coming from the community that he came from, you know, so it was really, really cool to see him and be able to add. I've, I've shared this quote, this was a long time ago, I've shared this quote a lot, and now I get to add that little bit of the story because I ran into this kid, you know. So again, it's just, just speaking to the power of like, he took a risk, he became vulnerable, he tried the practice of mindfulness, and when he did that, he got some, some, some powerful gains from it, right? Like he, he was able to transform aspects of his life because he did that, he did the work. And so um, I get asked this question all the time. Sam, you know, you work with gang members, you work with kids who are incarcerated, like how do you do it? How do you get those kids to meditate, you know? And I'm always like, buy my book. And I'm, no, I'm just kidding, I'm always like, uh, <laughs> I'm always like, I'm always like, you know, you will be surprised if you just walk in there and treat people like a human being, you'll be surprised at what they do. Like it's just about going in there and treating them like a human being, building that relationship. And then like I've been saying, that's how a lot of this work blossoms. If you go in there and you try to force it, kind of like what you were saying, even with the mind and the mindfulness, it's like, don't let your mind go away. If, you, if your mind goes away from your breath, you're a bad person, right? Like to sometimes that's how mindfulness and meditation can be taught, right? And it's the same thing like in our relationship too. It's like, if you do this, if you do that, if you keep doing drugs, if you keep doing those behaviors that take you back to the juvenile hall, you're a bad person. A lot of people may not say that, but it's through the vibration, it's through the relationship that they kind of, that the, that the young person gets the sense that this is just like some other adult who is gonna make pass judgment on my behaviors and if I'm doing something that's right or wrong or something like that, right? So the practice of building relationships, I like to call that relational mindfulness because it's something we're doing actively, intentionally to really build that relationship. A lot of people that I work with will say things like, oh yeah, I have a good relationship with this kid, my relationship with that kid isn't so good, whatever, you know? And it's like this passive thing. And my practice is really to bring that to the forefront and become much more intentional with the relationship. And when you do that, that's when all of this stuff happens. That's when young people are like, yeah, I'll try this mindfulness thing, because I trust you, you know? That's what it all comes down to. Um, so I'm just going to go over two very brief things when it comes to developing relational mindfulness. And I'm just going to hit you with this right up front. Hopefully this isn't like some rocket science to you. Because if this was like a day long or if this was a multi-day retreat, I would say to get this information for how to build authentic relationships, all you need to do is reflect on the authentic relationships that you have in your life write down all of those qualities, those are the qualities that you um, develop with the young people you work with. Yes, it's different, it's a professional relationship, but that's okay, it can still be an authentic professional relationship, right? So I wanna talk about a really brief receiving or a really powerful, what I like to call like a receiving practice, how we receive the youth, and then an offering practice. Um, but before I talk about that, because <laughs> I have this slide here, um, I, I'll just say really briefly on this one, you know, one of the biggest things, I think, when working with trauma-impacted youth is authenticity. I, I, and here's my quick question to the group, just for a little bit of engagement with you guys. Why might authenticity be important when you're working with trauma-impacted youth? Youth who have been victims of interpersonal violence, physical violence, community violence. Why would you practicing authenticity be important? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Safety. Did you say that? Oh, sorry. What do you mean by that? You're not, you're not being squared. You're not being true. You're not being clear. Then there's no balance for your safety in that. The organizer is in the mind. 
right? If you're not being true, if you're not being clear, there's no bounds for safety. That's what she said. And um, that's exactly right, right? F if you think about some of the situations that these young people have been in, a lot of the trauma often comes from the manipulation of adults, whether it's CSEC youth, whether it's you know, I, I, I work with, like I said, I work with a lot of gang members. I've heard this story over and over again in many different ways. And this was told to me by one of my clients. He said, you know, um, he, sometimes the, uh, the gang leaders will get us all together and give us a bunch of drugs. This was a, this was a, this was a b very big gang in the Bay Area. He said, they'll get us all hooked on meth. And be like, come through, we're going to party. We're going to do a big, whoop, whoop, whoop. Everybody comes in the room. They get everybody on a really intense stimulant, like methamphetamines or cocaine or something like that. And it's like, yeah, we're partying. And then all of a sudden, the gang leader says, well, this is what we got to do tonight. I need you to do this, you to do that, and you to do that. All very serious crimes, right? And so this guy who's telling me this, he wasn't a gang leader, but he was telling me, he was like, I know what they're doing. They're just getting us high so that we can go do their negative bidding. That happens a lot with youth because because adults will say, if you get caught, man, it's all good. You're just going to go to juvenile hall. You'll be out in a month or two. Like, you're not going to get charged as an adult, you know? And so that manipulative relationship pops up over and over again with gang youth, sometimes in even more severe situations with youth uh, who are trafficked, right? And so when we practice authenticity, sometimes, going back to what you were saying, if, um, if we're, if we're assessed as inauthentic, um, or I should say this in a different way, youth oftentimes assess the inauthenticity as a survival mechanism, because sometimes in the real world, um, it could really be a life or death situation. And I'm not even, you know, that's, that's the, the full truth. So practicing authenticity becomes a revolutionary act in some ways when you work with these young people. And I really like to think about it as a practice, just like I think, like to think about developing the relationship, right? It's not this passive thing like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of authentic or I'm an authentic person or I'm not an authentic person. It's no, how am I going to practice authentic self-awareness right now in this relationship with these folks that I work with, right? When you bring it to the forefront, when you do that, when you practice attunement, that's oftentimes the first way that young people start to get those vibrations from you, those things that they may not be able to clearly articulate, but the things that make them start to feel safe around you, exactly what you were saying. Um, so that's, that's something that I always have in the forefront of my mind that's always kind of playing. Um, but it's also something that you don't necessarily control in terms of how they perceive you, right? It's not like you, I'm not, I don't go into the room with the youth and it's like, hey, guess what, man? I'm authentic. You should trust me. You know, like I, I would not do that, right? They would be like, you're definitely not authentic because people don't say that, you know? <laughs> Right? But so it's more so it's something we think about and something we strive for. And there's a lot of different self-awareness practices that we don't have time for right now that you can do to practice that in the moment. But it's, it's so important that it's worth mentioning. Raise your hand again if you're a therapist. And raise your hand if you ever heard of the name Carl Rogers before. All right, cool. If you were a therapist and you didn't raise your hand, you failed this class. So you got <laughs> you to know who that is. He's one of the pioneers. Anyways, this is nothing. Well, I'm, well, the, the reason I'm saying that is this is nothing new. He talked about, in the 60s, he was talking about the quality of genuineness and how that impacts the therapeutic relationship, right? So that's something that we're always thinking about and striving for, but something that we can actually do, like something that we can think about and actually control, at least in and of ourselves, is a practice I like to call deep listening, which also isn't anything new. Uh, by show of hands, who knows who this fellow is? Awesome. Thich Nhat Hanh, very uh, revolutionary monk, uh, Vietnamese Zen monk uh, in France. He, the reason why I have his picture up here is because he, through his books, I learned about the practice of what he calls deep listening. And um, he defines that as a type of listening that helps alleviate suffering in another person. You're listening with one purpose to help that person empty what's on their mind, what's on their heart. That's what deep listening is. Again, that's not rocket science. But a lot of times in the relationship, when an adult walks into a room with youth, their mind starts to go to work on them. They start to, uh, youth starts to start talking about some issues, some problems, something like that. Their mind starts to go to, how can I fix it? Or I'm the adult. What do we need to do in this situation? And we live in a world right now, at least definitely in Western society, 
where youth don't get listened to. They're marginalized simply because we don't take into account their ideas. We don't listen to them. So again, another relational mindfulness revolutionary act becomes just really being present and listening to them. I can't tell you how many times youth have literally come up, youth who you would think would never engage in psychotherapy or anything like that, and they would come up to me after sessions or after our whole relationship is done and say, thank you so much for listening to me. Like that simple thing. I know you've all had that, I'm, prob I'm sure you've probably all had that experience where you know somebody's not listening to you, right? Like when you're in, I, this is funny, when I was in college, I went to UC Santa Cruz. Uh, we don't have any sports teams or anything like that that would compete with the University of Washington, but I just remember thinking I was cool having these like political debates with my friends, you know, and being like, you know, A, B, C, D, this is my side of the debate, and then thinking to myself like, yeah, that was like, that was smooth delivery, Sam, good job, you know? <laughs> And then my friend, who I'm having this debate with, says the exact same thing that I just said, but in an attacking way, like I didn't just say it, you know? It, looking at me like what you just said is wrong, because obviously when I was talking, they weren't listening to me. They were just thinking about what they were going to say next, right? That happens a lot with adults to young people, too, because oftentimes adults are put in that position of privilege of like, I'm right. You know, and maybe you don't think that about yourself individually, and hopefully that's true, right? But that's the experience that a lot of youth have just generally when it comes to the adults that they work with, is adults basically think they're right. And that's why youth are like, you guys think you're right, but you're not right. You're all stupid or something like that, right? That's, that's, when, that's when some of that resistance comes. And we don't have time to talk about that right now, but a lot of resistance from youth is actually person-made. It's things that we as adults sometimes do that if we just shifted gently, you know, um, um, that resistance wouldn't arise. And this is one way to start that, is just to practice deep listening, just to be present with them. Why is listening important? It's important because, again, not rock and science, but when you listen to somebody, you have a better chance of conceptually understanding them, right? If you don't listen to somebody, you're probably not going to understand them cognitively because you didn't listen to them. But if you listen to them, you have more of a chance of understanding them, conceptual or cognitive understanding, oftentimes, or has the potential to lead to emotional understanding. That's empathy. That has the potential to lead to compassion. That's like I witness somebody else's struggle and their suffering, and I have a desire to help alleviate that struggle or suffering. And that leads to connection. Anybody want to guess? And for those of you who are researchers, you're not allowed to answer this question because you already know the answer. Anybody want to guess, or if you know, What's one of the main variables that leads to positive outcome in psychotherapy? Therapeutic alliance, right, the relationship, right? Yeah, that's generally right. And there's been some very important research to show that something very particular about the relationship in, in the alliance is important. And that's the client's view of the therapist. If they view you as a caring, empathetic, compassionate person, therapist, then treatment outcome goes up just because they view you that way. So doing a practice like this and leading to connection and when you actually feel compassion and you feel empathy and you sometimes in um, skillful ways might disclose that to them, which we'll talk about in a moment, then they start to see that about you. And just because of that, that's one uh, variable of the relationship that'll help your outcome go up. Whether you're a therapist doing substance abuse treatment or anger management or depression or anxiety treatment, whatever it is. It's something that, like I said, is very simple, but it's powerful. That's why the relationship is so important, and that's why it's so important to, to think about it. And again, bring it to the forefront of your mind. It's not just this passive thing that happens, but it's something that you think about, because when you think about that, you can think about, I'm going to practice listening deeply and being present to this person, and that's something that can be felt. I, one, one last uh, anecdote about this. I work with a lot of parents, too. And I had a person come in uh, a couple of months ago. And he was like, um, his son um, started getting in trouble and was referred to uh, a therapist. And then the court system was like, you need to get some counseling, too. But they were kind of just like, you need to you know, check off the box and make sure you're OK kind of thing. And so the son's therapist referred the father to me. And the father comes in and he says, you know, I think this therapy thing is bullshit, but no disrespect to you, though, you know. <laughs> and, um, 
and I said, it's, you know, no worries, man, it's all good. Like, let's just talk, and I'll just listen, and wherever it goes, it's okay. I'm not going to force you to do anything. I'm not going to analyze you or anything like that. Most of what I just did in that first session was listen. He was going through, turned out this guy was going through an extremely difficult time in his life. Crushed. All the emotions started to come out. By the end of the first session, he only needed to do one session. That's what the court said. By the end of, the, the end of that session, he said those magic words. He said, you know what, man? I think I'll come back. This is all private practice, out of pocket, high fee. I got three books. It's a high fee. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? This dude, it's not like he's impoverished, but he's not rich. That's for sure. And he says, I think I'll come back. And then he said those, the magic words. It's just, I just like your vibes, man. What did I do? Not that much. I just listened and was present to him. You know, that's, that's as far as sometimes it can go, you know, something so simple. So anyways, so that was, a, that was kind of like what I like to think about as a receiving practice. This thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is what, what I like to call an offer, offering practice, which I like to call skillful self-disclosure. How many people here, either in your job or your training, were trained not to talk about yourself with the people you work with. Okay, yeah. A lot of that happens a lot in graduate school. And what I'm gonna talk about here is how self-disclosure is always happening and how it's really important in some ways to skillfully, very important word, skillfully and appropriately disclose things about yourself because the key is the young people that we're working with need to see us, if we wanna have a real human being relationship, Guess what? They need to see us as a human being. How do they see us as a human being? It's through things that we show them about us. That's how the relationship forms. And if you never have self-disclosed before, or if you believe that it's not good, that's OK, because sometimes there are some very not good forms of self-disclosure. But self-disclosure is happening all the time uh, in, in some form or another. I walk into the room you know, with youth in this country at least, and they see this ring on my finger, it says something about me. You know, usually when I walk into a room and I'm running a group, I'm not wearing the suit jacket, and they see the tattoos, right? It says something about me. They, they create a story about me. They create a story about me by the way I walk, the way I talk, the clothes I wear, all of that. Self-disclosure is one way to authentically clarify that story so that you guys can have accurate stories about each other and build a real authentic relationship. Um, so, that's why it's important. It's important because they can't, we, we, we want them to see us as human and not just some machine that's a part of the system. So I was working with this um, young man once, and he was 16 years old, juvenile detention camp. He um, was really ambivalent. He grew up in an impoverished neighborhood, gang, all that stuff, really ambivalent. And he was talking to me about college. He um, was unclear on if he wanted to go to college, go the academic route, or just go back to the street life, just what, basically what he knew. And he, you know, we're in this conversation, he's like, Sam, did you go to college? Okay, now I have an opportunity. There's a choice point right here. Do I disclose this about myself? I'm giving a talk on self-disclosure, so yes, I disclosed about myself. I said, yes, I went to college. Where did you go to college? UC Santa Cruz. Was it fun? Yeah, it was fun. There was uh, hard work at times. Was there girls there? He was a young man. Yeah, I was like, it's usually like somewhere between half and half, something like that. And then he goes right back into his own story, talking about his ambivalence. Well, man, I don't know if I can do it. You know, I don't know anything about that path, but I, there's a side of me that really wants to do it. That's the ambivalence, right? That's what oftentimes what happens in these touch points of self-disclosure. They often young people will oftentimes tap you in to their story, but then go back into their story, right? I want you to imagine this for a moment. You're 16 years old. You ask me, Sam, did you go to college? And I say to you, let's examine why you want to know that about me right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, what's that reaction? My reaction would be like, what the, you know, <laughs> what the heck? Simple question. You're supposed to have a PhD. You can't answer that question, you know? <laughs> um, oftentimes in graduate schools or different trainings when, when people are, and if, if, the, if this hasn't been your training, good, because it's oftentimes the untraining of this. People are said to, or people are taught to, um, if somebody asks you a question about yourself, then you gotta throw it back on them, you know? Do like this little bob and weave technique, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and people teach that because it's like, you don't want them to have that info about you because they're gonna take that info, they're gonna ball it up, and they're gonna manipulate you with it, right? 
operating from a place of fear. Doesn't always happen. Sometimes it might happen, right? But it doesn't always happen. And most of the time it doesn't happen if you're just upfront with youth. You know, though in that interaction I was talking about, they just go back into their own story. But you may be thinking, that was an easy situation, Sam. He's asking you, did you go to college? For me, I don't have a problem disclosing, you know, if I went to college or not. That's just me personally, right? What if, what if somebody asks you something that you don't want to say? What do you do there? So I have another story for you. Um, I was working with another young man, in, actually in the same juvenile detention camp, and he was a very, very high-ranking gang member. Um, this guy was 16 years old. This is not an exaggeration. He was literally telling people who were like 21, 22 what to do in the streets. That's how high-ranking he was. Um, and we had a good rapport. We met, this was about like maybe a month or two into our relationship. Met with each other six or seven or eight times or something like that. And he's talking about his girlfriend and his struggles with his girlfriend on the outs, right? And he's like, uh, you know, we're talking a little bit. And then he turns to me and he says, Sam, do you have a girlfriend? And, you know, I'm married now, but at the time she was my girlfriend. I was like, yeah, I have a girlfriend. And he was like, did you sleep with her last night? And I was like, oh, shnikes. <laughs> What am I supposed to do right now? What do my graduate school professors tell me? Because I'm thinking to myself, I, you know what? I'm not that much older than this kid. I was like 24 at the time or something like that. But I'm, like, I'm still just like, this isn't appropriate. I shouldn't talk about this, right? And um, so I said to him, I, I kind of took a breath. And I was like, you know what, man? Uh, you know, anything you want to talk about in here is on the table. This is your time. But for me, I just don't feel comfortable talking about that with you. I'm really sorry. What do you think his response was to that? No, it was not. It's cool. If it was cool, he doesn't make it all the way to the University of Washington. He goes, well, wait a minute. Wait just a minute, Sam. You want, to come, you want me to come in here and talk about myself, but you don't want to talk about yourself. What's up with that? That's what he says to me. That's what his response was. It's actually not an illogical question from someone from his perspective and experience. So then I said, well, hold on, man. Hold the phone, you know. Uh, I tell you about myself all the time. You know, you know that I have a girlfriend. You don't know this, but 15, 20 years from now, I'm going to be doing these lectures on skillful self-disclosure. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm here, right? <laughs> and he leans in. This is a juvenile detention camp. There's like 30 kids in the camp. He leans in, and he goes, don't worry, man. I'm not going to tell anyone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And in this moment, in this interaction, there's this uh, power dynamic that's going on, right? There's this tension. And I said to him, you know, I said to myself first, I said, you know what? What am I really feeling right now? If you don't get anything else from this talk, this is how you bring mindfulness into your work. It's bringing it into yourself and your own self-awareness when you're working with young people, when situations get tense. This will help prevent burnout, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, help you stay present so that you can be your best self in working with youth. What I said to myself was, how am I really feeling right now? I'm feeling punked, like challenged. I'm feeling punked right now. And I said to him, you know what, man? Can we just pause for a moment? Like I said, he was a very, very high-ranking gang member. Doesn't matter, like, to get that high in the gang, you have to have something going on up here. Very intelligent young man, right? Um, doesn't matter if you grew up in the gang, if you're a family member, like, if you don't have something going on up here, you're not going to get that high in terms of the rank, right? And so I said, let's pause for a minute. I said, I'm feeling really punked right now, you know? Um, what do you think about that? And he was like, well, I don't know. And I was like, well, you know, we have a pretty good rapport. We've been meeting, with, meeting about six or seven sessions or something like that. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering, like, what purpose it serves, you know? And he was like, well, I don't know. And we, we basically unpacked it. And I like to think of self-awareness like an onion. Like, you pull one layer back of the onion, there's another layer there. Like, those are our defense mechanisms, our protective mechanisms. We came to this beautiful understanding of course, this kid was trying to punk me in the moment. Oh, and by the way, one, one very important distinction when I said, let's pause for a moment. I said, I'm feeling punked right now. I did not say, you are punking me right now. That would have put him on the defensive, right? I just owned, I attuned to my own personal experience, practiced mindfulness about what I'm feeling, and I owned that experience, right? And so, anyways, we came to this understanding of like, well, of course he was trying to do that unconsciously with me. That's how he's raised in the ranks, and that's how he survived most of his life. Our therapy was forever changed after that. If you were to take a snapshot of our sessions, two, three sessions down the line after that, it was like some guy coming to private practice, highly motivated client, you know, not a very 
um, intense gang member, at least most people would think, right? And it just completely changed. And so the most important thing when it comes to self-disclosure is that word skillful. What makes it skillful? I'll give you the answer to, at least in my opinion, because we're running out of time. And that's, I always ask, before I talk about myself with youth, I always ask myself this question, is what I'm about to say in their best interest? Is what I'm about to say in the best interest of the young person that I'm working with? At least that puts me in a reflective state so I'm not just spewing out information. Because sometimes self-disclosure can be very bad if you're just throwing up your life story on people when they don't ask for it. You know, I didn't want to hear that about you. You know, I had, I've, had people, I've had people in my life when I was a young person do unskillful self-disclosure where I'm like, man, that was too much. As a 14-year-old, as I felt that, you know? And so I always ask myself, is what I'm about to say in their best interest? You may be wrong. You may not always be right. You may think, yes, it's in their best interest, but, uh, and then when you do it, it comes off the wrong way or something like that. That's okay. We're all human beings. That's what the relationship is for. If there's an impasse, we heal that impasse. That's what the process is about, you know? But when you ask yourself that question, it helps for you to think about what you're going to say before you say it. The sub-question to that is, um, is what can I handle what I'm about to say to the young people? Let's say you're in a situation where a young person you work with just lost a loved one, and it was lost a loved one in the last couple of weeks, and maybe you lost a loved one six months ago, and you think to yourself, wow, this person lost his brother, I just lost my uncle, he's so alone right now, she's so depressed, so isolated from the world, I'm gonna disclose to this person that I lost that too, that somebody else went through this experience and it will help them feel more connected in this world right now. And so you say, is it in their best interest? Yes, in their best interest, check that box off. Then you start to disclose that to the young person. Hey, I've had this experience too. You start to cry a little bit, sadness comes up. It's okay to cry in front of people, but this isn't the cute cry. This is the type of cry where the snot comes out and you start sniveling, <laughs> you know, start hyperventilating a little bit, hyperventilating a little bit, excuse me. And then what's, what's happening in that moment? Who's the therapist in that moment? The kid. The kid is sitting there and, and listening to you. And so another question you always want to ask yourself is, can I handle it? You know, If you're going to say something about yourself, let's say somebody went through a traumatic experience and you had a similar experience, you, if you can maintain whatever your role is, role of the therapist, role of the teacher, role of the adult, so that you can put their experience first, then it has the potential to be skillful. But if you can't do it, then it shouldn't be talked about. You may have things in your life right now that you're not comfortable talking about. And maybe five years from now, you might be comfortable talking about. You, have, you may have things in your life right now that you're not comfortable talking about and you're never going to feel comfortable talking about. A best practice is to think about, well, if you work with youth, is to think about those things ahead of time and just mentally prepare yourself. Because if you go back to that interaction with the young person that I was talking about, Instead, it, even if I were to say, I really just don't feel comfortable talking about this, right? And that was it. At least I put up that boundary. At least I didn't manipulate the situation and try to throw it back on them. And in that other situation I was talking about where the kid was asking me about my girlfriend, I actually didn't share that information. I put that boundary up because I didn't feel comfortable doing that. And while at the time I didn't really know what I was doing, it just kind of happened and then I reflected on it because it was so long ago. If it were to happen again, I'm a little bit more mentally prepared for it so that I could really sit in that authenticity with the youth and, 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 and get to the underlying process of what's going on between us, which is much more oftentimes um, uh, beneficial for the relationship. So that's what we've talked about. Um, deep listening, we talked about authenticity, we talked about skillful self-disclosure. What else do I have here? Another meditation, which we don't have time for. How about some Q&A? It's 8.22. Um, I want to get you guys out of here on time. Does anybody have any questions about anything, uh, anything that we talked about today? Yes, I think we have. They want to record you um, and send it to the government. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, there's a, there's a um, microphone right here. And if you don't want to get up, just shout it out, and I'll repeat your question. This right here? Yeah. So he's asking for video camera people, uh, is this a model or did I come up with it? Uh, I came up with this slide and I thought about this all by myself, but I'm not claiming to have invented that. I think this is just perennial knowledge right here. Yeah. So um, it to me, so, so I guess I came up with it, but um, I, I'm sure somebody else came up with it somewhere else before me because I'm not that old. So 
Yes, another question. Um, you mentioned reflecting on your experience with that person, and place seems really important. And I was wondering how do you differentiate between reflection and unhelpful rumination on like what you could have done, or just how you like. Which experience are you talking about? Um, the last one I talked about. So the que so let me just make sure I have the que the question clear. You're talking about the difference between unhelpful rumination and reflection, as in what I said to them about my personal experience? Yeah, and your um, like reflection on whether that was skillful and like how to move forward. Oh, oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so the question is like, I reflected on that after the fact, and that's what kind of got me to the point where I was started talking about this in talks and, and reflecting on it so that afterwards, in the future, I would be more mentally prepared for it. Is that c accurate to what you're asking about? Yeah, OK, cool. Um, uh, I think what, in my reflections, what brought me to that conclusion, because you're right, like I was saying, like I, it's not that in the moment, because I was so young in the game, so to speak, that I didn't really know what I was, I didn't plan to do that. It just kind of happened, and then I reflected on it. Um, I think what helped me to come to that conclusion was, one, I was able to hold the boundary, because I did feel uncomfortable, because I didn't want to actually share that information with them. But it was in a way where, at, where, even though it was a little bit uncomfortable at first, it brought us through a process that deepened our relationship. And that was the main variable that kind of led me to believe, like, OK, you know, um, that, was, that was probably a skillful thing. Like, I've, I've worked with a lot of youth in juvenile hall who I've told I'm incar I've been incarcerated before. And I've worked with a lot of youth in juvenile hall who I never told I was incarcerated because I didn't think it would add any value to the relationship. And so going through that initial process was what kind of got my mind going in terms of like, like, yeah, there's things we can say about ourselves that sometimes can be unskillful because the only other um, conceptual map or schema that a lot of folks have in this space is kind of like preachers coming in and preaching their life story and saying this is why you should change. It's kind of like a like an AA model, which is you know it ha there's a time and a place for that where people get up and say you know this has been my life experience, et cetera, et cetera. But I noticed that when other people were coming in and doing that in the institution, because it's kind of a common thing, they'd have like a, a, a somebody come in and be like I've been through it all. You know, and, and oftentimes the, um, the subtext, like the medical communication, even when they're not trying to do this, like I've been through it all, but what's oftentimes gets said to the youth or what they receive is, I've been through it all, you don't have any experience like me, like my experience has been more tough than yours, right? And I started noticing that over time. And youth would, like, I would be in the room witnessing the, the speaker come in, but I was the therapist, so I get to go, like, hear the youth's perspectives after that. And they would tell me, like, they, like just another adult coming in thinking he knows everything about my experience or thinking she knows everything about my experience. So th that, coupled with that initial experience I was talking about, led me to start really kind of, like, like etching out this idea that, yeah, like, and I, I didn't in obviously invent this idea of self-disclosure, appropriate self-disclosure, or skillful self-disclosure, but it helped solidify it for me in my personal experience, you know? So it was kind of a mix between all of those things. Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, one more, and then I'll st I could stick around because we got started late and, um, oh, you're gonna hand it off? Who, somebody, yes? Okay. So I work with adults as well as adults uh, and an acupuncturist and counselor and also with incarcerated men. I'm um, one of the adult persons here. And in my work with people who particularly are leaning toward panic attack or have pretty strong trauma, but I've actually had experiences where introducing them to breath work is triggering them. Mm -hmm. So leaning toward other practices and the same practice. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, so the question is, um, if I could distill it, it's, um, you know, any experience with uh, the breath in trauma-impacted populations, because sometimes, especially with folks who've had panic disorders and things like that, the breath in and of itself can be triggering. Great question. Um, so this, to me, really goes back to, one, 
that mindfulness is more than just breathing. B the breath is what we use. Oft Oftentimes the breath is used when you start to learn meditation because the breath is always here, the breath is always now. So it's an anchor into the, it's like a, a, a hook into the present moment, right? But if you just think about the lion mind, right? You can be practicing mindfulness whenever, right now, when you're taking a walk, when you're washing dishes, right? You don't need to be meditating to do it. Meditation is like the formal lifting in a sense. It's like going to the gym, right? But, but to, you know, to go to the football metaphor, since I know you guys got a big gang, game coming up, it's, uh, you know, and then I am going to circle back to your question, I promise. <laughs> uh, but I'm just on a tangent right now. Um, you know, meditation is like the formal lifting, lifting informal mindfulness is like the, uh, um, the like in the moment, the relational stuff, right? And so if you think of somebody on the University of Washington football team, what do they do to train? They go into the gym and they hit the bench press, right? Because it makes them strong. It makes them able to do their job better when they get on the field. When the quarterback hikes the ball and the game starts and the play starts, that person does not sit down and start doing the bench press, right? They do whatever it is they do. That's the informal side, right? That's the, whatever the play in, in, the, uh, in the football game is, right? And so um, I always think about that as because of these types of situations, because we want to think about mindfulness as something more than the breath and more than meditation. So the other side that I think about is the work of Stephen Porges. And I'm just going to find this real quick. Um, Oops, I passed it. And in his work with the vagus nerve. And so one of the things about the central nervous system, when somebody gets really triggered and they go what's out of what's called the window of tolerance, that's, what's, that's when they're in like that total tunnel vision. That's when they're in fight or flight if they're up here. That's when they're in freeze if they're down here, right? One of the best things you can do, and this is a phrase that's really important to remember, rhythm supports regulation. Bilateral stimulation of the central nervous system, the vagus nerve, oftentimes helps somebody come back into that window of tolerance, that zone where they then might be able to practice a breathing technique. But if you introduce a breathing technique and they've had some trauma and that in and of itself triggers them, that's a sign for you to back off a little bit and not to try and force it. Like, no, 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 this is going to help you. Like, come on, it's going to help you, you know? Like, no, that, that's a sign to say to yourself, okay, what else can I do to help, help this person regulate? themselves so that I can then maybe in the future teach a um, teach him something him or her something like a breathing technique oftentimes for folks like that you want to do what I like to call strike while the iron is cold when the iron is hot that's when they're about to have that panic attack right when the iron is cold that's when they're not in that mode and you're talking with them and you say hey you know I have this, tra this practice that's really been helpful for me are you willing to give it a try and just so you know, because I know this may trigger you, it, it has something to do with breathing techniques. And if they trust you, if there's a relationship there, they may have more of an inclination to actually do that with you. Maybe it takes a long time to do it, but they can actually, you know, that's the path to introducing something like that. But again, it's not something we want to force. We want to find other ways to support that rhythmic movement, ryth rhythmic regulation, so that they can come back into that zone of optimal arousal. I'll say this, so I don't, I've never Never said this story this fast, but I'll just say really quickly. Once had a kid, went through something very tragic. He was in my office. He was going out of that window of tolerance. You can tell when somebody shifts into that fight, flight, or freeze because oftentimes they can't put a sentence together, right? He started saying, Sam, I just need to, I just can't, I just, he couldn't put a sentence together, right? When, it, when somebody goes into fight, flight, freeze, the prefrontal cortex, the neocortex, oftentimes it starts to shut down. That's called down regulation. So I said, you know what, man? Forget about this therapy thing. I had this little computer in my office. And I said, let's just listen to some music for a little bit. He throws on the headphones, listen to one of his favorite songs, another of his favorite songs. I, I noticed that he starts to do this with the music, just moving with the rhythm and the beat, right? This rhythmic movement is called is bilateral stimulation. It's bringing him back into that window of tolerance. And then after that, after about 10 minutes of that, he's able to say, dang, man. And we, he had lost somebody in his life. He's like, dang, man, we were just talking about that person last week. And we had been talking about this person the week before. So what's the first thing I noticed? Now I can put a sentence together. So he's coming back into that window of tolerance. And then I can do other interventions with him, you know, like meditation or maybe something else. You know, I'm a big proponent of mindfulness, but it's something that I never would ever try to force on somebody, if that makes sense. So um, we should stop there. Yes.
before we show our appreciation for this very authentic and um, touching presentation. I do want to, I've been told, people were passing me notes during the talk, um, that you have received in your email that you registered with um, a way to give us uh, some feedback on tonight's lecture. So we'll ask you to do that. And you can give us some feedback right now by thanking Sam for this. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I definitely wish you all the best in your work with young folks and um, good luck in that football game. <laughs> You'll probably need it. I'm just kidding, I don't like Ohio State. <laughs>